Here's how you get around the comic strip. By now, you must have gotten to the main menu, where you got to me, your guide. From the main menu, you have a couple of choices. Choose Intro to get a message from Stan Lee. Press Start Comic Book to start reading from the beginning. If you press Go to Page, you'll be able to type in a page number and go right to that page. If you press Trivia, you can play the trivia game. You'll also see a switch labeled VoiceOver On, Off. Switch it over to Off if you want to skip the action summaries of the pages and turn off the sound effects. Finally, the Character Bios button will take you to the biographies, where you'll get the information on all the characters in the comic. Just click on any of their faces to learn more about them. Once you're at a comic page, you use the Next button to go to the next page and the Previous button to get to the page before. The Zoom In and Zoom Out buttons will make the picture larger or smaller. There are three sizes to check out. The small size is good for seeing the whole page at a time. The big size is a good size for reading. And the huge size is for great eye-popping detail. The BIOS button on the control strip will take you to the character information pages. When you get to the character you want and you decide to go back, you press Done and you'll get to the main menu of characters. Then press Done again and you'll get back to the comic page you are on. There's also a Help button on the control strip. Press this to get a summary showing you what buttons do what in case you forget. Finally, you have your Menu button to get you back to the first main menu screen. You'll see the cursor turn into a hand when you roll the mouse over the comic page in the big sized page and the huge sized page. This means you can drag the page around the screen. To drag it, click the mouse somewhere on the page and with the mouse button down, move the mouse in the direction you want to go. If you move the mouse all the way to the top or bottom of the page and hold it down, the page will scroll automatically. You can also move the page up or down, or in the huge page size, left and right, using the up, down, left and right arrow keys. Meanwhile, keep your eyes peeled for funny symbols on the page. They will appear in selected places throughout the comic. Usually, they will be in the lower left-hand corners of the panels, but sometimes they will be in other spots. You might see an ear, a comic book, or a TV set. Click the mouse twice anywhere in the panels with the symbols. If it's an ear panel, you'll get to hear the action. If it's a TV set, you'll get to see the action with a clip from the TV show. If it's a comic book, it'll take you back through time to another issue of the comic to give you background about the story you're reading. Then you can read the flashback issue just like the main comic, only when you're done, click back and get back to the page you were on before. Of course, when you're done with the comic, you just go back to the main menu and press quit. Nuff said. You know, you know something? I'll bet there's one thing you've never done before. You've never accompanied the invincible Iron Man on a CD-ROM as he goes back in time to wage a duel to the death with the dreaded Dr. Doom in the medieval age of King Arthur. But don't worry, thanks to Marvel's unbounded generosity, you're about to get the chance. Now, due to a diabolical twist of time and fate, Iron Man and Doom realize that while they're trapped in the perilous past, neither can survive without the other. Just imagine having to depend on Dr. Doom for your very life. And speaking of the lethal Lord of Latveria, for the first time ever, you're about to learn how Dr. Doom became the diabolical human demon that he is today. And don't dare miss the computer-enhanced living biographies of all the major stars in this Iron Man epic. You know, we did it just for you. Marvel Comics presents Iron Man vs. Doctor Doom Part 1 Doom Quest
At sea, pirate helicopters attack a Stark International cargo ship. The ruthlessly efficient pirates soon prevail. Their goal? The ship's valuable cargo. But before the payload can be seized, a flash of light heralds the arrival of the invincible Iron Man, who swiftly disables two of the helicopters. Pirates prove no match for Iron Man and are quickly neutralized. As the relieved crew thanks the armored Avenger, he relays orders from Tony Stark to turn the ship around immediately and return to port. But that's not going to happen! Iron Man streaks back to the Long Island headquarters of Stark International, where, as Tony Stark, he must attend an important meeting. Using a concealed door, he enters the visitors' quarters that are his temporary home. Reflecting on the disorganized state of his life, Stark prepares for the regional manager's meeting, which has started without him. Taking control of the meeting, he singles out the sales record of the head of his Miami branch. Stark has discovered that the Miami branch of Stark International has negotiated the sale of specialized components to Latveria, the former kingdom of Dr. Doom. Stark has canceled the shipment and fires the Miami branch head for disobeying corporate policy. Meanwhile, several centuries in the past, deep in his shadowy chambers, the master mage Cagliostro has completed the mystical education of his latest pupil, none other than the nefarious Dr. Doom. As payment for his secret knowledge, Dr. Doom presents Cagliostro with a small chest of jewels.
keeping a control on his gauntlet, Dr. Doom signals his chief scientist, Hauptmann. Seconds later, a glowing rectangle of light descends upon Doom, leaving the startled Cagliostro alone in his chambers. In the Latvian castle stronghold of Dr. Doom, the ex-monarch emerges from the rectangle of light in an enormous laboratory. Hauptmann explains to his master that the shipment from Stark International has been withdrawn. Furious, Doom declares that he intends to obtain his shipment, one way or another. She demands of a time machine strain and my resources. Convinced that Dr. Doom will come after the components denied him, Iron Man stands guard at a Stark International Warehouse. The Avenger expects an attack from the air, but danger lurks below, in the form of a submarine tank. A sneak attack from Doom's vessel smashes Iron Man, along with the entire pier he's sitting on. When he moves in for a counterattack, a missile wraps his armor with electrical wires, jamming his circuitry. The tank rolls on, demolishing the warehouse in search of its prize. Unable to stabilize his armor's electronic systems, Iron Man shuts them all down. Dropping like a rock in the path of the tank, he disappears under its churning treads. The Avenger's armor protects his body, and the treads tear away the jamming wires, unwittingly freeing him. <laughs> Dropping its treads, the tank takes to the air, with Iron Man in hot pursuit. Rapid cannon fire forces him to take evasive action, costing precious seconds. In an instant, the tank reaches top speed and disappears over the horizon. Doctor Doom gets what he came for.
Mere hours later, a Stark Enterprises Learjet transports Tony Stark to Latveria, where he intends to confront Dr. Doom personally. As he wonders how he will discover Doom's current whereabouts, Stark suddenly finds himself surrounded by armed guards who look poised for the attack. As Stark wonders how he could ever hope to get out of such a mess, General Craig of the Latvian army unexpectedly welcomes Stark to his country and presents him with directions to Dr. Doom's castle. He explains to a surprised Stark that the current king of Latveria fears Doom and wishes to aid Doom's enemies. Once in his armor, Iron Man easily finds Dr. Doom's castle and touches down in a large, empty courtyard. Using his visual sensors, he discovers a hidden doorway and enters cautiously. Presenting the Origin of Iron Man Iron Man is born. Watch his awesome approach. Listen to his ponderous footsteps as he lumbers closer. Today you are destined to encounter the invincible Iron Man. Millionaire inventor Tony Stark demonstrates his latest invention under tight security. Stark's tiny transistors can increase the power of a magnet a thousandfold making it strong enough to pull apart a steel vault door. The military has grand plans for such impressive technology. Wealthy industrialist and sophisticated playboy Tony Stark is as much at home in a laboratory as in high society. But across the world in Vietnam, the powerful guerrilla warlord Wong Chu lives a different life, plundering defenseless villages. In Vietnam, Tony Stark's inventions are put to use. He checks the use of his transistors in the weapons of American troops. Though the transistors are a success, Stark is gravely wounded by a booby trap and captured by Wong Chu.
Wang Chu promises to have his surgeon save Stark's life if he builds a new weapon for the guerrillas. Realizing Wang Chu is lying and that no operation can save him, Stark agrees to work for Wang Chu, but secretly intends to make a device to save himself. Aided by another prisoner, the brilliant Professor Yin Sen, Stark uses his transistors to build an iron suit which will keep his heart beating. The life-giving mechanism is ready just as Stark's condition becomes critical. Professor Yin Sen is in the middle of powering up the iron suit when Wang Chu approaches. Yin Sen sacrifices his life to give Stark a chance to reach full power. Now an Iron Man, Tony Stark swears his friend will not have died in vain. With sufficient energy driving his suit of armor, Iron Man rises. He must learn to adapt to his new invention quickly, for Wang Chu's men are smashing down the door to the lab. Iron Man falters for a moment, realizing he must forever live inside a metal prison of his own making. And then, as Wang Chu threatens to finally break in, Iron Man triggers air jets which carry him to the ceiling, where he clings with special suction cups until the soldiers leave. In the village courtyard, Wang Chu indulges in his favorite sport, fighting the poor villagers. Suddenly, a new challenger appears. Iron Man. Wang Chu is no match for the armored Stark, who defeats him easily. Wang Chu orders his guards to fire at Iron Man, but the bullets bounce harmlessly off his armor. Preparing a reverse polarity magnet powered by one of his transistors, Iron Man repels the rest of the guards' attacks. Then he easily disrupts Wang Chu's amplified war cries with electrical interference.
Switching his own voice onto Wang Chu's loudspeaker, Iron Man commands the soldiers to flee. With a miniature buzzsaw, he cuts his way into Wang Chu's office, but is toppled by a falling file cabinet filled with rocks. With his power running low, Iron Man realizes he must finish Wang Chu quickly. He squirts a thin stream of oil toward the ammo dump. As Wang Chu passes it, Iron Man lights the oil and the dump explodes. Professor Yin Sen has been avenged, and a new hero is born. With his armor's tracking system fixed on the stolen equipment, Iron Man moves deep into the castle of Doctor Doom. Suddenly, he is ambushed by three huge security robots. With time of the essence, Iron Man strikes, leaving the robots a pile of scrap. At the heart of the castle, Iron Man comes face to face with Doctor Doom. He demands Doom return the stolen equipment, which the ex-monarch insists was purchased fairly. His patience at an end, Doom turns to attack Iron Man. Triggering the powerful molecule expander in his gauntlet, Dr. Doom sends an avalanche of boulders hurtling toward his foe. Iron Man thinks quickly, changing the polarity of his armor to repel the rocks with a reverse magnetic field. He buys some time with the clever maneuver. Iron Man locates the machinery that contains the components stolen from Stark Enterprises. But before he can retrieve them, Dr. Doom recovers and attacks. A repulsor blast throws Doom to the ground, but serves only to infuriate the evil monarch, who decides Iron Man deserves his full wrath. The two armored titans trade thundering blows. As they face off, Dr. Doom sends a massive charge of electricity flooding into his foe's circuits. Iron Man matches Doom volt for volt as the very air around them begins to crackle. Iron Man and Doctor Doom fail to notice Hauptmann throwing a safety switch, which activates the time machine, hurling the startled combatants away through time and space. Once the two warriors disappear, Hauptmann wrecks the machine, happy to be rid of his hated master forever.
Iron Man and Doctor Doom plummet through time, a thick, sticky world, peopled by possibilities, by maybes, by could-have-beens. Iron Man vs. Doctor Doom, Part 2, Nightmare Their forced journey through time coming to an abrupt ending, Iron Man and Doctor Doom find themselves in a grassy courtyard that Doom sees as promisingly familiar. As they get their bearings, the two armored adversaries are shocked to realize they have just arrived in Camelot. Realizing the magnitude of their predicament, Iron Man wonders how they will ever get back to their own time. Dr. Doom dismisses his small-minded concerns as they are confronted by the armored knights of none other than King Arthur. Dr. Doom is unamused by the knight's threatening demand that they kneel. When one of the soldiers attempts to force the matter, Doom easily knocks him to the ground and sends deadly electricity coursing through the lands of his compatriot. Iron Man breaks up the combat with a repulsor blast and convinces Doctor Doom that they must cooperate with the local populace. Grudgingly, Doom agrees and they accompany the knights into Camelot. Uh, ah, ah, ah. Amidst the blare of ceremonial trumpets, Iron Man and Doctor Doom are led into the throne room of Camelot, where they come into the majestic presence of King Arthur. The king asked the newcomers if they serve his evil sister Morgana. Iron Man answers King Arthur that he seeks only a peaceful return to his own country after settling his differences with Doom. Questioned about his supposed sorcery, Iron Man admits to having some powers and levitates Arthur's throne as evidence. Presenting The Origin of Doctor Doom Dr. Doom remembers his first days of college in America. Reed Richards points out an error in his equations for trans-dimensional warps, but the angry young Victor Von Doom ignores his warnings and proceeds with his forbidden experiments.
Von Doom's luck eventually runs out. An explosion results in his being expelled and deported. Moreover, his face is scarred in the blast, leaving him traumatized, unwilling to ever show his face in public again. After years of wandering alone in the mountains, Victor Von Doom is taken in by the inhabitants of a hidden city. Soon the brilliant young man rises to power in the city and commands that a fantastic suit of armor be forged for him. So that mortal eyes may never again look upon his hideous countenance, Von Doom has a burning hot mask seared onto his face. At that moment, Victor Von Doom is reborn as Dr. Doom. His face on fire, Dr. Doom runs outside and collapses in the snow. When he recovers, he realizes it is time for him to leave the Lost Plateau. Dr. Doom must assume his rightful place as absolute master of the world. Contrary to Iron Man's humility, Doom declares that he is also a king and demands from Arthur the respect due to a fellow sovereign. Confused, King Arthur decides that the newcomer shall be his guests until he can determine what shall be done with them. Alone in his guest quarters, Iron Man feels despair at being a man of technology trapped in a primitive world. The lonely hero's spirits are raised when a young woman arrives to provide him with companionship during his stay. Dr. Doom broods in his quarters. He needs information and gets it in the person of the young woman sent to serve as his companion in the castle. Under Doom's hypnosis, the woman tells him the location of the castle of Morgana Le Fay. Having obtained the information he needs, Dr. Doom blasts a new exit in the side of his chamber. He easily dispatches a guard, ignites his rocket pack, and flies off into the night.
When morning comes, King Arthur informs Iron Man of Doom's violent departure. The only clue to Doom's plans is the servant girl, who continually babbles the name of Morgana Le Fay, whom Arthur reveals is a powerful sorceress who seeks his destruction. Arthur explains that with the aid of his mystical sword Excalibur and his own wizard Merlin, he defeated Morgana and imprisoned her in her castle. With Merlin gone and Doom possibly in league with Morgana, Arthur needs a champion. Iron Man offers to be that champion. On a commandeered steed, Dr. Doom makes his way through the Valley of Wailing Mists to the castle of Morgana Le Fay. Stopping at the seemingly unguarded drawbridge, the suspicious Doom surmises that Morgana would never leave herself unprotected. Tossing the pommel of his saddle onto the drawbridge, Doom is not surprised to see it pass through the bridge and drop into the moat below. He is impressed to note that the pommel disintegrates in the corrosive liquid which fills the moat. Morgana has defended her territory admirably. Activating his rocket pack, Doom soars up through the mists toward a window in the castle's tallest tower. He enters and finds the fearsome Morgana Le Fay herself waiting for him. Morgana explains to Dr. Doom that she's been watching him through her mystic mirror since he arrived in the realm of Camelot. She admits that she is impressed with his power and bids him to explain why he has come to her. Dr. Doom tells Morgana the story of his mother, a gypsy sorceress. She was cursed to spend her afterlife in eternal damnation. Doom has been searching through time for the mystical knowledge to finally set her soul free. He believes Morgana has the power he seeks. Morgana agrees to help Doom free his mother's soul if he will lead her army into battle against King Arthur. She possesses a chip of the mystical sword Excalibur that links all the souls taken by that blade. With Doom as their leader, the vengeful souls would make an unbeatable army. As Morgana Le Fay utters an arcane spell, her mystic mirror shows Dr. Doom a chilling sight. On a nearby battleground, the dead rise from the earth and fall into ranks. Doom agrees to lead this unholy mass of soldiers against Camelot. At dawn, 
A sentry interrupts a war council with grave news. Rushing to the castle walls, King Arthur and Iron Man see Doctor Doom leading a legion of the dead toward Camelot under the banner of Morgana Le Fay. Arthur is committed to confronting his enemies, and Iron Man vows to fight to the death by his side. As the armies meet outside Camelot, Iron Man makes a final plea for Doom to stop the upcoming war. With a cry from King Arthur, the defenders of Camelot charge into battle. The armies of the living and the dead clash on the ground, while above, Iron Man and Doctor Doom unleash the destructive power of the most sophisticated armored weaponry ever invented. Valiantly, the men of Camelot struggle against the assembled souls of the victims of Excalibur. Scores of soldiers fall on both sides, while Iron Man and Doctor Doom soar overhead, locked in furious combat. Wielding mighty Excalibur, King Arthur dispatches countless foes, cutting a swath through their ranks. Meanwhile, Iron Man is forced to refrain from using his full power against Doctor Doom, as there exists no source of energy in the past capable of replenishing it. Iron Man's physical attack knocks Doctor Doom off balance. Taking advantage of this momentary distraction, Iron Man leaves the battle, rocketing across the country toward the castle of Morgana Le Fay, whom he realizes must have conjured the dead army. Morgana watches Iron Man approaching in her mystic mirror and prepares a special spell for his arrival. Dark light crystals home in on the hero outside the castle and engulf him in mysterious inky black tendrils. Iron Man begins to panic as the solid black light crushes him. Regaining his composure, he focuses on a scientific solution to the problem. Figuring the way to fight black light is with white light, Iron Man triggers his chest unibeam, dispersing the tendrils. Morgana Le Fay releases her pet hawk to dispatch Iron Man. Outside the castle walls, it grows from an ordinary bird into a massive, deadly, scaled beast, ready to shred Iron Man in its bone-cracking claws.
The bird beast's tail rocks Iron Man in midair. He tries to take out the creature with brute force, but to little avail. Again relying on science to combat magic, Iron Man takes a glass tube containing Freon from a compartment in his armor and hurls it at the onrushing monstrosity. The Freon tube breaks against the bird beast's body, freezing it solid in an instant. The brittle monster tumbles from the sky and shatters into fragments as it hits the ground. His way now clear, Iron Man confronts Morgana in her tower. Promising to return to destroy both Iron Man and King Arthur, Morgana disappears into another dimension, taking with her the Excalibur Shard. With the Shard gone, Doom's army of the dead is no more. He has been abandoned. <laughs> Dr. Doom speeds back to Morgana's castle, afraid she may no longer be able to fulfill her part of the bargain. The enraged Doom destroys an entire wall of the tower as he enters, demanding to know where the sorceress is. Iron Man is taken aback by the unfettered rage of Dr. Doom, but he is doubly surprised when Doom does not attack. With Morgana gone, the villain has no reason to stay in the past. He proposes to build a time machine using circuits from both men's armor. For a long, tense moment, Iron Man considers whether to trust a man who has sworn to kill him. In the end, he knows that Dr. Doom is his only way back to the present. Counting to three, they power down their armor and begin to fashion a makeshift time machine. By pooling their knowledge and the components of their super-advanced armor, Dr. Doom and Iron Man manage to construct the beginnings of a time machine. As they work, each gains a grudging respect for the intellect of the other. Once their jerry-rigged time travel device is ready, Iron Man suggests that his truce with Dr. Doom last for 24 hours after they return home. Doom reluctantly agrees, and they trigger the device ripping open the fabric of time. In the mountains of Latveria, brilliant light explodes as a temporal gateway opens, depositing Dr. Doom and Iron Man back in their own time. Doom warns his foe that they will meet again, and Iron Man promises to be waiting. Then each armored warrior turns away and heads for home.
shards embedded next to my spine by the blast. And I'll never forget the Mandarin's eyes, or the incredible power of his rings when he showed me his insane chessboard. He ordered me to create an invincible armor with which his forces could conquer the Earth. I was guarded at first, but soon the danger of my work, my steadily weakening condition, convinced the Mandarin that survival was my concern. Not escape, he was correct. I was in torment. Day and night merged into a seamless tapestry of despair. And awake or sleeping, my father's words echoed in my soul. With my gifts came responsibility. I must make a difference for the good and pledge my work and my life to ensure the continuation of our democracy. How I longed to honor those obligations, but I was little more than a slave pursuing what seemed a scientific illusion. Then the Mandarin became impatient and changed his game plan. Where is my armor? What you want is impossible. Such a word is not new to me. Perhaps this will enlarge your vocabulary. When all else has been taken, the only freedom remaining is the freedom to interpret events as you see fit. No matter what was in that coffin, I chose not to fear it. Lion God Emperor. It seems like a thousand years ago when he attacked me from his coffin. Stay back. I am old, but I will not go quietly to my doom. I don't intend to harm you. I thought you were attacking me. The Mandarin has a sadistic sense of humor. Yin Sen? Dr. Wellington Yin Sen? You know me? Oh, I am dizzy. Let me help you. Of course I know you. You're the greatest physicist in the world. That is a dubious assumption, young man, but thank you. Uh, ah, I am definitely too old for adventures in the martial arts. It didn't look that way to me. Your costume and makeup. I was performing a bit of classical opera for my grandson's eighth birthday when the Mandarin's thugs spirited me off quite roughly. Obviously, they were theater critics. <laughs> I was kidnapped, too. I'm supposed to come up with an invincible armor so the Mandarin can take over the world, but so far, no luck. Ah, neuromimetic telepresence. Well, that's the key, of course. That's your special field. The Mandarin obviously means for us to work together, but I won't do it. Do you hear me, Mandarin? I'm through being your slave. A colorful but accurate statement, my young friend. For now, let us bend. Hope we can activate the armor in the time we have. None of them realize that the armor has been tuned to your neuromimetic signature, Tony. Until you interface your thoughts with its computer or touch it, it is lifeless. Profound good luck, my son. What is it? You called me son. It was unexpected. But sincere. Now hurry! Yes. It works! I'll armor up and get us out of here. No! The Mandarin must not know that you and the man in armor are one and the same. Better he should believe he has two implacable foes. A little straw from my bed, my theatrical training, and the bits of makeup remaining from my opera costume serve the purpose well. Now, remove your clothing and don the armor quickly. Do not attempt to hurry the armor donning process. You must take sufficient time for the neuromimetic interface to be complete, or you will be too weak to fight effectively. Inside my armor, my broken body felt no pain. What my mind directed, my armor delivered. Its power far greater than I imagined. The obligation to use it wisely, weighing far heavier than I dreamed possible. Thanks to Yin Sen, I had achieved the incredible and made peace with my father's memory. Tell me, does it work? It's amazing, the power! But I'm strangely disoriented. Use your scanners. Ah! Whatever or whoever you are, that armor is mine! No, you're not ready! Ah! Yin Sen! Never forget.
forget what happened here. And neither will you. I was free. Free. For you, General Hirsch? Tony! It's all right, Walter. 
I'm not the customer, Mr. Stark. Your country is. If your robot chopper's slick enough to serve her in wartime, I'll be satisfied. I happen to be against war, General. I've been in three of them, kid. I am, too. Initiate test bombing run on target. The Stark helicopter can handle any supersonic heat-seeking weapons you've got, General. See what I mean? Huh? Looks like you forgot about old-fashioned flak, Mr. Stark. I'm sorry, Walter. I'll have to award the chopper contract to Justin Hammer. Black resistors were in the specifications. I put them there. I removed them to increase attack speed and substituted an anti-flak chip relay, but it didn't kick in. Guess I blew it, huh? No, Tony. We blew it. Stark and Sun. The anti-flak chip failed. It's not my fault. Two years of hard work that affects every one of our employees. Work that might have saved decent lives in combat, all for nothing. Because of your careless attitude, your mindless search for pleasure. I tried to build a business that could provide the technology our democracy will need in the next century. But I see it means nothing to you, Tony. Nothing at all. Tony, we couldn't find you. I was at a charity scavenger hunt. Dad! Justin Hammer. I, I found out he's behind the accidents. Trying to ruin us. Save your strength. It's not fair to expect you to feel like I do about Stark and Son. You... you have your own life to lead. My life? See, I wanted to be just like you. The way you always wanted. My new inventions and your patents. Hard work, some luck, and we grew. We made a difference, Dad. We did good. 